Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Rachel Verona Coat. Uh, Rachel, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm very happy to be back. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming back. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Um, let's see. I don't know. I guess uh, I. what's most pertinent. I am a writer in uh, the greater D.C. area in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, and I have, a, um, I have a book coming out in about a week and a half uh, called uh, Too Much, How Victorian Constraints Still Bind Women Today. It's the, uh, held- it's a, yes, it's a very reflective cover. I'm trying to... <laughs> okay, yes. There we go. Yeah, great, a great cover. This, so this image, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image of, Ju- of Ju- no, is it Helen of Troy or is it... Helen of Troy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and actually, if I uh, if I thought thought ahead, I would have had um, the final copy uh, in my lap, and then I could have just held that up. But uh, I won't. Right. So this is this is the you know advanced reader's copy. So it will look somewhat different when you go to your local bookstore or wherever you uh, purchase well, yeah, books. A little bit more matte. Uh, <laughs> less, uh, less, uh, less reflective, but yeah, but basically the same. That's the cover. Okay. So, um, so, oh, so uh, again, thank you again for coming back on. Um, and the book is too much how Victorian constraints still bind women today. Um, so this is, this is an interesting book is I, I, I think actually when we, we had our previous conversation, we, you said you had this book coming out. I was like, Oh, come back for, for it. That sounds great. It was, it's a little different than I thought it was. I think it's just the, the genre is, fairly novel to me you're combining a lot of different kinds of narrative uh mm-hmm. together so uh, it's partially a memoir it's mm-hmm. partially um literary criticism focusing especially on victorian literature mm-hmm. um there there's contemporary cultural criticism uh yeah. you talk about um Britney spears and sex of the city and uh Nicki minaj and lots of other uh, things from culture of the past you know the recent past and then the kind of a general cultural you know, uh, cultural criticism or gender criticism or something um, that that ties it all together. So, how did you kind of like how did you arrive at this fo- the, the form of this for for this book? Um. Well, I guess in terms of the way the way I thought about it, um, I didn't I didn't want to. Um, I wanted it first and foremost to be a work of cultural criticism. I I didn't. Um, you know, maybe at some point, um, I'd like to, to write a full memoir. Uh, but, uh, that's not what I wanted to do, uh, with, with this particular book. I, you know, I, I had an argument, uh, that, that I wanted to make. Um, and I, but it, but it's an argument that does come from a very personal place. Uh, and so I, I thought that it might be might be useful uh, to use myself as a little bit of a case study uh, mm-hmm. in you know so you know doing some personal storytelling, but where it felt like it was in in the service of uh, of what I was trying to to unpack. Um, so uh, you know so I. And so I wanted to, so I thought that might be useful. I also, um, you know, I think that Victorian literature is a really important and a really rich archive. Uh, but, um, I, but I didn't, I didn't only want to stay there for, for a couple reasons. The, the first being that, you know, it's, it's inherently limited, um, and so I wanted I wanted to be able to uh, incorporate or I wanted to uh, uh, kind of extend uh, the conversation because um, it's I think it's something that is relevant uh, to far more than, you know, the sort of white genteel woman that you know, that would have been reading many of these Victorian novels or, um, and, and a lot of cases also, you know, white genteel men. Um, 
And uh, I also felt that uh, in order to argue for the resonance, in order to sort of um, to sketch out uh, how uh, certain ideologies, certain sort of cultural trends, certain modes of thinking, certain certain narratives that we get very attached to, the way that they persist. The only way to do that is to to sort of demonstrate different sort of iterations uh, that are, you know, that are uh, current. That uh, so uh, so I wanted uh, so while of course you know it is uh, in, in large part, you know, there's a, a great deal of focus on Victorian literature and culture, uh, cultural history. I, I thought that, uh, it was, it was important, uh, to demonstrate that, that these, that a lot of, uh, that a lot of these, uh, uh, sort of, uh, Concepts isn't quite the right word, but uh, again, s- stories that that some of the most powerful people who've had their grip uh, on uh, culture that these these uh, narratives that uh, that writers were responding to in the Victorian period uh, that and other writers were sort of reiterating or uh, reifying that that they, that they haven't, that they've endured that, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's absolutely reductive to say that we're still, you know, in a sort of Victorian mode. That's, that's, that would not be correct. But, um, I think that there are, uh, there are certain, um, there are certain places where, where this is, it's sort of, uh, chillingly present. Uh, so, so that, uh, was what sort of motivated me uh, to to take the conversation uh, to to the 21st century uh, uh, and and you know, a little bit to the 90s where a lot of you know my pop culture interests resides, but also I think you know is still sort of present enough that uh, is that I think there was there was a lot there to discuss um, and then. Uh, to to sort of emphasize uh, the way that all of this can can manifest in in a life in in a in one particular life. Uh, oh. The only life that I have access to in, <laughs> in that way is mine. So that's uh, so that's sort of um, the that was sort of the way that uh, I uh, kind of determined. Uh, where uh, the different a- avenues that I would take and thread together. Mm-hmm. Was there, w- did you have a kind of, um, was there another book you were like looking to as kind of a forerunner of what you were trying to do? Because I couldn't think of an exact um, example of something that combined like literary analysis, pr- like personal memoir, contemporary cultural analysis, and like, you know, cultural criticism all, <laughs> all in the same uh, thing. Uh, is there, are there writers you you look to uh, for for guidance or anything like that? Um, let's see. I well, you know, part of you know, I, I think you know, as you know, uh, my uh, my background is is in academia. Uh, so you know, this is still uh, full disclosure. This this is still something that I'm you know that I'm trying out. I'm still um, you know. I am, uh, this book was sort of my first attempt to take, uh, this, what I loved, uh, about the sort of conversations that I got to have in, uh, in an academic space, uh, but, uh, but bring it into, uh, an arena where, uh, there was just many more broader possibilities and, um, and to uh, to put it into a context where uh, all sorts of uh, readers uh, can uh, can engage, not just people who had the money to to go and and uh, read Foucault for for a semester. Uh-huh. Um, 
but in term in terms of who who I sort of look to, um, who I think uh, does a really uh, wonderful job with uh, with with this sort of work. Um, I, I hope that she will write a book uh, very very soon. Uh, but. Lily Loofborough, uh, who's at Slate, uh, uh-huh. I I admire I admire her work tremendously. Um, I think that um, Anne Helen Peterson was one of the first people uh, that I saw coming out of academia and saying, "Hey, you know, there's, um, you know, let let me take uh, my training and." Uh, and put it in the service of this of this uh, vast cultural conversation, and um, and I really, uh, you know, I really uh, was delighted by uh, her first two books and looking to thir- uh, forward to her third. Um, my, you know, now he writes strict literary criticism, but my uh, my dissertation advisor uh, Bill Cohen, so uh, you know just a brilliant thinker and, uh, and wordsmith. And, um, and he has this wonderful book embo- called embodied. Um, and it's uh, and it's a work of Victorian literary criticism that really shaped a lot of my thinking. Um, so, and then also uh, Maggie Nelson, the Argonauts, I think uh, now she's really, um, She's got a really power, powerful grasp of uh, continental philosophy, um, in 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 a way that I do not, um, and and that is sort of uh, where some of where she goes um, in in that text. But I, you know, I think our our, our styles differ. But I, uh, you know, like uh, like many women in my demographic, I'm. Uh, strident uh maggie nelson fan and and rightfully so she's i think she's one of our our greatest thinkers writing today um so so it was you know i think i'm i'm influenced by like everyone else i'm influenced by everything i i i read uh but but those are just uh those are those are a few uh folks um even in a way this is this is sort of uh maybe it seems a little out in left field uh, but I also really love the way that Alison Bechtel uh, sort of incorporates uh, theory in uh, in her graphic memoirs. Uh, yeah. I, so she she sort of uh, uh, unites uh, a few different mo- uh, a number of different modes uh, in her in her manner of storytelling. Uh, so so certainly it it it, it was definitely a hodgepodge. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm really, really fortunate, uh, to have, uh, had, uh, the opportunity to, to read all of these people and to spend time with their books. And, um, and, uh, and so I think little, probably little by little, all of these different pieces sort of, uh, helped me kind of puzzle together. Okay. So this is how I sort of want to do this. If I, if I were going to take my academic enthusiasms and take my, you know, my, my interest in sort of personal storytelling and, and my desire to, to write, uh, outside of, uh, the academic tradition. And if I were to do that in a book, uh, in the form of a book, well, you know, this is, this is, this is how I might do it. This, this is what it might look like. Right. And something that just occurred to me, um, is I think, you, there's some like kind of new journalism, participatory journalism, uh, almost like this isn't quite right, but like uh, the documentary Super Size Me, of like you know you you're set, you center yourself and you get to know like the reader gets to know you through this mm-hmm. work, but and th- things that happen to your life and you're not like going off and doing experiments, but you're uh, using you know using your personal experience to filter through uh, all these other topics and um, and then so it's it's uh, the reader receives a portrait of you. Uh, by the end, by the end of the book. Um, so let, let's talk about that part some more. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess I was I'm familiar with you from your essays and um, and Twitter and, and the conversation we had about 
nine months ago. Uh, but yeah. you, you talk a lot about uh, uh, very personal topics uh, related to your life in here. Um, I, I don't know. I've, I don't want to like spoil stuff, but you talk about like self harm and the breakup of your first marriage and infidelity, yeah. and in a very you know a very like straightforward and honest way. Um, is what was the process of you know deciding that you you know did want to discuss these things forthrightly and and how is you know are you what what is the experience of that been of just like putting these very personal parts of your life uh, on the page? Um, you know, it was mixed. Um, the sort of the way I I came to it, I I knew sort of what the um, the sort of scaffolding was. I, I knew um, I had an idea of, okay, well, I know I want a chapter on this. I know I want a chapter on this, on this. I feel, you know, I want a chapter on this because I feel I want a chapter on self-harm because I feel like that's something that um, isn't written about as much. Um, I, th- I really wanted to write about, uh, the idea of fallen women. Um, and well, you know, I get, you know, if you, if you stuck me in the 19th century or I mean, even now, I, you know, I guess I'm something of a fallen woman. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was, <laughs> well, it's, it's just funny to think it's, it's like, you know, you are immersing yourself in Victorian literature and, you know, like uh, the, yeah, the Anna Karenina, uh, kind of, uh, storyline, um, it, it, you know, it, it's like, not, not exactly, but there, yeah, so, yeah, so there's parallels between those, the classic Madame Bovary, uh, Anna Karenina storylines and, like, what happened to you when you were in your, in your 20s. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, so writing about cutting, uh, that was very difficult, um, I, I would do it again. Uh, I'm I'm glad that I did it. I think that sometimes, um, sometimes something that writing about something that's worth it, that's worth that's uh, worth getting to the bottom of, um, can can be painful. Uh, it can uh, be it can it can dredge up some some difficult. Uh, and unwieldy uh, urges and feelings. Um, I think that writing about it gave me uh, clarity, which is often the sort of thing that I'm chasing uh, when I write, which, you know, I think is, I think a lot of us who write, I think that's what we're, we're seeking. Um, and it gave me clarity. Uh, cl- cl- I just, uh, I just accidentally started saying therapy as I, as I said, was trying to say clarity, which is kind of interesting slip. Okay, so that's a spoonerism and a neologism. Uh, yeah. the, the clarity you get from therapy is a... <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I do get clarity from therapy, too. Uh, but, um, yes, I think, I think it gave me clarity um, that, I, that I was... That I was, um, I was pursuing, I think. Um, so there was, you know, there was a selfish element there. Um, I hope I hope it will be um, useful or, or resonant uh, for readers who may have uh, endured or live, lived with or are living with a sort of similar um, manifestation of mental illness. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, it it. it was, uh, I, I was a little, I was certainly, um, smug, uh, going into it. Uh, I, because by the end of the chapter, I, I was really struggling and, and I, and I didn't, it, you know, perhaps foolishly, I didn't realize, uh, how, um, how much I, I would be, uh, a s- similar thing, uh, some, a uh, similar situation writing about, uh, the, sort of quick disintegration of my, of my first marriage. Uh, you know, I, um, I still feel, uh, a great deal of, of shame, uh, about, about the choices that I made. Um, 
you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with the fact that I'm, that I feel, um, uh, that I will always be sorry for having hurt people, uh, people close to me and, um, and people who, you know, uh, who didn't, you know, who didn't deserve that. Um, and it, but it was also a very, uh, it was also a really, um, harrowing time where I felt sort of isolated and, and disconnected, uh, from, from myself in a lot of ways. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm very, very fortunate that, um, that my, that my story did not end the way, you know, uh, Anna Karenina ends or, uh, that, uh, you know, I didn't end up as a Tessa the D'Urbervilles or, you know, something, uh, something like that. Um, but I, nonetheless, I, I felt like it was an important story to tell, um, as long as I could do it ethically and stay focused on, on the fact that what, what I was talking about when, when I was, uh, going, uh, when I was sort of drawing from personal experience, the important thing, uh, was the decisions that I made and, you know, what led me to, to certain, uh, to make certain choices. Um, and, uh, so I thought, well, if I can do that, I, I think that, uh, this, this experience is, is probably a useful one to share if, if, if I can do it, uh, because, we, you know, I, you know, I am, I'm very happily married. Uh, but I also think it's true that we fetishize monogamy and we fetishize and we fetishize the institution of marriage still. And I think, and while it is certainly the case, uh, that no one was forcing my hand to get married, that was, that was a choice that I made. I, I also, I can look back and think about how I sort of moved towards that decision and why I felt it was so important to make this decision, even though, you know, if I'd really been willing uh, to sit with myself and sit with the doubts that I had, I, even though I you know, some consideration would have revealed to me, this is not a good choice. I, you know, I think uh, that there was just so, uh, that I had absorbed so much of the sort of cultural imperative, uh, to, to be coupled and, uh, you know, to, to get married, that that was the right course of things. And, you know, I'd been in a relationship for a certain amount of time and, you know, this was, you know, somebody who, um, you know, who was, uh, decent and, you know, and the relationship had it'd been solid in, in a number of ways. And, and, and so, uh, you know, again, the, the responsibility for it all that that's on me, but I do think that, um, I do think that we, that there are, again, there's just so much that just sort of seeps into us and, um, you know, uh, and, and we're, you know, we're doing a little, a little better with it, but, uh, I, with this, with the conversation that we're having around marriage, I think that a lot of people, uh, a lot of brave people are, are pushing back, uh, against uh, the idea that marriage should always be the goal. Uh, but, but not necessarily enough. And I think, I think that it's important, uh, to, to say, you know, there, we, uh, you know, this, this sort of climate that we, that we've created, the way that we're thinking about relationships, um, and, uh, sort of continuing to, uh, to emphasize the, the, the heterosexual, 
monogamous, uh, mar- uh, marital arrangement, uh, it, it really, uh, it really fucks with us. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it, after it was only after I, I got divorced that I realized there were so many other people who had, had been in similar situations, had, you know, had married, uh, their, their college sweetheart or, uh, you know, something, uh, something along those lines. And then one or both, uh, members of the party, uh, thought, oh, oh no, no, this is, this is, this is not right for, for any number of reasons. And, you know, I, uh, but it's, uh, but it's so, it's difficult to talk about that because, because it feels embarrassing. It feels embarrassing to say that you got married and then less than a year later, uh, in your twenties realized, oh shit, this isn't, Mm-hmm. This wasn't right. I made a, I made it, you know, uh, to you know, uh, quote Job. I made a huge mistake. <laughs> right. That's, that's a Arrested Development job, not biblical job. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Well, so the okay. Let's talk about the title for a moment. So you, you say so too much is the title. Uh, so I'd like you to talk about that. And also you you mentioned that maybe it came to the title came to you through uh, a Dave Matthews song. Um, or a lyric in a Dave Matthews song, or at least that that was one point where the phrase occurred in your consciousness. Um, uh, okay, but what, what is like? What is to, is it? Is it that women's emotions are too much for the society that of the Victorian era and still continuing on to today? What or what is what is what is too much? It's too much. Um, I uh, so. Well, so, okay, so I'll, I'll answer this in two parts. Uh, so where, in terms of where the, where the idea came from, um, yes, absolutely. There is that Dave, Dave Matthews, uh, band song that was, you know, like on everybody's AIM profiles when we were all in college and probably was on mine too. Probably. I mean, I went to college in Virginia and, you know, Ed, uh, if you're not familiar, Dave Matthews, uh, lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a num- I think at l- least one or two members of the band were students at UVA. Oh, wow. um, and so if you're, you went to UVA or William & Mary, where I went, or, you know, everybody, like Dave, Dave is, was just sort of, it was like default that you're supposed to be kind of in him. And um, so, uh, so I'd certainly heard this phrase, uh, you know, in certain different, different places. And I hadn't started making the connection, but yeah, you know, Dave Matthews song too much. And there was the Spice Girls who also had the song, their song too much, which I think is a better song. Um, but where, where it really, um, where it really kind of, uh, started to, uh, take root, um, that was, well, I guess it was about 10 years ago when um, the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland uh, adaptation came out and I went to see it uh, and it was, you know, it was all right. Uh, but um, I, I was really, I was really fascinated by uh, this one particular uh, component, uh, which is, which is that when Alice, who's now 18 at, in, um, in the world of the film, um, when she goes back to Wonderland, uh, and Wonderland is now, it, it's even more bananas than usual. You know, uh, it's, you know, everything in Wonderland is always sort of perilous, but it's, you know, uh, doubly so um, now. The And... Uh, Alice's friends are sort of hoping that she can, she can save the day, but they are, uh, they're sort of dubious about her ability to do so because they keep saying that she's lost her muchness. And, um, in, in the film, this means, you know, her, her chutzpah, her, her sort of, um, her verve, her, her, um, uh, her 
her uh, bravery, her audacity. Um, and so one of the threads of the film uh, is uh, traces Alice's sort of rediscovery of her muchness or uh, whether, whether she's rediscovering it because she never actually lost it or she, you know, and she has to resummon it. That's probably what it comes down to. But anyway. <laughs> so uh, the muchness was inside of you all along that kind of. Yes. yes. Kind of so the muchness, it was the, the friends we made along the way. <laughs> uh, and, um, but the thing, but what I thought was sort of interesting when, uh, you know, I'm, I was leaving the film and I'm, I'm just, I had really just hooked onto that word. And, I, and the reason I hooked onto it was because I thought, well, gosh, you know, it's really lovely that they, that this word muchness, uh, is, um, is such a positive thing, such a, uh, such a just indisputably positive trait. Uh, because if you had just sort of given me this made up word and said, come up with a definition for it, I would have come up with something that was probably pretty negative. Uh -huh. And that was, uh, sort of that kind of came from my own experience of feeling like I was too much, uh, which is to say fundamentally excessive, uh, sort of, uh, enable to, to keep myself from sort of spilling out everywhere, whether emotionally or, um, you know, because, uh, my, my, the volume of my voice can tend to, uh, tend to, to raise without me realizing, or because I, you know, gesticulate so much, mm -hmm. uh, or because of my sexuality or, you know, any of, any of these things. And so, uh, so in, as I was thinking about, okay, well, what is too much, um, too, too much is in, in my, in my sort of, un, uh, sort of estimation, uh, this idea of too muchness is, is a very, uh, gender quality. It's not to say that I don't think this is a conversation that could include men. I absolutely think it could, um, but I think that there is a way uh, that we tend to think about women uh, in uh, that, and this is something that I think very much uh, coalesced in um, in, uh, in a systemic way, especially in the Victorian period because of the hysteria diagnoses, um, that women are just fundamentally excessive. They're fun. So they're, they're, uh, you know, we're unruly. Uh, our, our bodies are unruly apparently because apparently our uteruses just sort of, uh, migrate all over mm -hmm. and cause a cause all sorts of haywire. Um, you know, we're because we're all, we always see, we're always apparently just on the verge of a breakdown. So we probably shouldn't read too many novels because that's just overstimulating. It, it, it's as if, you know, it's almost as if, uh, women, are these were were always just sort of um, just at the saturation point mm -hmm. in terms of emotion and, and sexuality and and um, and uh, and just general uh, disposition or, or, or uh, physiology and and you know and were. Uh, you know, we're in danger of, uh, spilling out everywhere or exploding, uh, in inappropriate or anxiety producing or, uh, you know, uh, altogether, unse altogether unseemly ways. Uh -huh. Um, and, 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 and so I think, and I think that's what, 
and then, and this is all, I mean, it, it's a very vague term. And I think that, and that's actually what makes it such a pernicious term. I mean, if, uh, if someone is uh, regarded as being too much, you're not necessarily pointing to any one thing. It, it's sort of, uh, the the implication is, is that there's just something essentially uh, excessive and and that is to say wrong with you um, and you know and again you know I'm talking I I'm talking about this as a white cisgender woman um, and this has been my experience and the number of the you know and the women most of the women in Victorian novels, or at least the heroines in Victorian novels, are white cisgender women. Um, but you know, I, I think that there is certainly a much larger conversation to be had. One, you know, uh, one that you know, I don't. It would be presumptuous of me to, you know, to to try and uh, to speak much beyond my experience. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but I, I think that, uh, you know, for the idea that women are too much is it's, uh, it's just, it's a very, uh, it comes from a very essentialist and ultimately kind of misogynistic place. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the the book is a uh, a defense of too muchness? Because I'm thinking like, so the, I mean the lyrics from that Dave Matthews song we, we uh, um, referenced previously. I ate too much. I drink too much. I want too much. Too much. That's too much. The, that's the chorus. And so if I eat too much, I have a tummy ache. And if I drink too much, you know I'm drunk and will have a hangover the next day. And I guess if I want too much, then I'm never going to be satisfied in life. And those all seem like bad things to me. Um, so do you do you think too, that is this a defense of too muchness or, or just an analysis of the charge of too muchness or, or what? Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's just sort of an unequivocal defense of, of too muchness, um, you know, without, you know, and, you know, end of story. Uh, not that that would not uh, be the case. I my my critique is coming from the way that there has been a stigma attached to. Um, excess as it has been conceptualized and, at, you know, as it's been sort of, um, uh, perceived and, and, uh, by, uh, by patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that really, you know, sure. I, you know, I think that, I think that if, one feels that they are are too much or that they've been made to feel that they are too much uh, because they're because they're too loud or their um, or their body is doesn't conform to uh, certain uh, accepted norms or, um, be, or because, uh, they're queer or, you know, you know, so on and so forth, then absolutely. I think, you know, n you know, this is, this sounds, I think, you know, it's maybe sort of like school assembly, but you know, no one has a right to tell you that, that you're wrong, you know, you know and, and so if, if it is, if it is a source of comfort and empowerment uh, to uh, to take this word, say uh, too muchness, and and say, okay, you know, this is something that I feel has been lobbed at me my entire life, but uh, these are all of the things that I feel uh, 
mate are really off my, you know, to the extent that any of us can be authentic, my authentic self, uh, then, then awesome, you know, wonderful. Take, take the term, hold it close. And, um, I, I think ultimately we, the, my, my feeling is that we, we all have to decide for ourselves, uh, where, you know, where we, you know, how we want to embody the, uh, how, how we, you know, what we want our embodiment to be, how we want to navigate the world and, you know, what, and what feels right. And so, and we don't, and we just simply don't have the right to, to cast judgment, cast aspersions, uh, upon another person, uh, for, you know, as long as they're living in an ethical and empathetic way. This isn't to say that, you know, people should be able to do whatever the hell they want and, (laughs) you know, no judgment, never be held to account. No, you're just, you know, this isn't to say that, um, you know, that if tomorrow somebody like, I don't know, Hope Hicks said, oh, well, you know, people can't just can't deal with my too muchness. No, people cannot deal with you because you are, you know, you've supported, um, you know, a racist autocrat. And, uh, you know, that that's that's the problem. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, th- this isn't this isn't meant uh, I, I I'm I'm certainly not interested in um, in uh, sort of allowing a term to just sort of be taken and 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 used as, as a defense against uh, behavior or choices that are, um, you know, that make, uh, that endanger, uh, the world or, you know, are, are, are toxic or any, or anything like that. Uh, but I do think it is important to think about the ways that, um, the idea of excessiveness has been so gendered. It has been so, uh, ubiquitously attributed to people, uh, living at the margins and, uh, and I think that we need to interrogate that and think about the ways that we can uh, demand more of ourselves uh, and, you know, and extend to others more empathy and empath- and compassion and uh, a, uh, you know, uh, a and a, and sort of push towards a a, a larger uh, ideology of inclusion. Mm-hmm. So okay, so one of the things that happens in some Victorian novels is that you know, like uh, the woman is punished for behavior that the man is not punished for the same behavior. So in Anna Karenina, uh, uh, Anna and Vronsky have an affair. Um, you know, Anna ends up giving birth to a child. I read this book 15 years ago, but you can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. So she has the responsibility of the child, but but ultimately uh, she, spoiler alert, kills herself, um, whereas he doesn't. So she suffers the punishment of of the you know breaking the the marital taboo, and he is more or less <laughs> you know he continues living at least, and it, it, that usually seems to be you know the 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 there's the, the fallen woman suffers the, the, like the fallen man, if that's even a thing, seems to like carry on. Right. That's okay. Um, so in one, in one account, this is like, um, you know, there, so, okay. So there weren't like uh, divorce laws or easy access to abortion back then. So these, these things provided like, uh, you couldn't have the easy escape pot <laughs> that, that, that would happen, uh, today. Um, and there's an interesting essay that um, Jeffrey Eugenides wrote about 15 years ago about how, uh, you know, the traditional no- novel was dead because of, of divorce. Um, 
but anyway, uh, so in one in one sense, it's like okay, you know. So obviously, this is unfair. The, the woman should not be either. You know, like there, if there's punishment, it should be equal punishment. Now, should it should it be that the um, and then this kind of made me think of this uh, this op ed that ran in the Times late last year. I think the woman's name is Ruth Whipman, um, who wrote it, and it was something like, uh, "Women shouldn't lean in; men should lean out." Do you remember mm. this one? I think, yeah, I think so, yeah. So it was kind of like saying, you know, the lean-in movement in, like, corporate workplaces had encouraged women to act like men in the workplace of, like, you know, all, like, working 60 hours a week and giving it all and, you know, being aggressive, especially uh, traditionally a masculine trait. And then she was saying, like, no, this is, like, this is, like, a, a trap. Like, this is not feminist at all. It should be that convincing, like, that men should act more like women, like, less aggressive, more cooperative, more willing to take time off from work for family needs and stuff like that. And that would, like, make everyone happier. Um, so, like, you know, the, the people, Sheryl Sandberg and those people, like, focused, <laughs> like, had, the, entire, had it entirely backwards. So, so, you know, generally people, you know, there's still social sanction for having an affair and stuff, but, like, you can get divorced and... Abortion is available in some parts of the country and not easily available in others. Like, you, uh, this is a confused question, but do, do you think, like, you know, it, it, should it be like the? Would it be fairer if like the the social section like fell equally between the genders, or if we said like really there shouldn't be, like there should be a social section, and you know Anna should have been treated like Vronsky was treated um, by uh, society in Saint Petersburg, and and just and just forgiven. Sure. Well, first of all, so now, because now I can't remember if Anna gets pregnant by Vronsky. I'm almost positive she does have a child, but I can't remember who, if Vronsky raises it or if Karenin raises it. Okay. I think it's Karenin, but I could be wrong. Uh, he, yeah, he's sort of a long-suffering fellow. Seems, seems like the sort of thing you do. Right. Um, so, no, I see what, I see what you're saying. Um, I, I feel like I don't, I don't have an e- easy answer. I think, I think we fall into a trap when, you know, I, I totally, I, I remember, I remember that op-ed. Um, I, I remember it coming out and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I read it. Uh, but it's, it, it's been some time. I think, I think we fall into a trap when we say, you know, women be more like men, men be more like women because I mean, and I know this, this sound, this, this sounds really, uh, this might sound absurd, but it's women and man and man are, are just, they're so, they're such over-determined terms. Uh, and, and, and at this point they've, and you know, what's, what's it, I, I don't think that we should be, uh, putting as much stock in men being like anything, uh, and just, and the same with, with women, you know, now it is, it is, you know, anytime, because anytime we do that, anytime we, we start, um, saying, and, and, you know, this is something that, you know, I don't know to how, uh, how well I, I avoided this trap in, in the book, but it's certainly something I think about, you know, I, I don't want to fall into that sort of gender essentialist trap of, you know, that women are like this, men are like this. Well, you know, no, not, not necessarily. And, and there are all sorts of women and there are all sorts of men and there are all, and there are all sorts of people who, uh, who are, who are neither. And, and so, so I think, what I think what we really uh, we need to do is and gosh, it, you know, it, it's hard. I, if I wish, I wish I were more equipped to, to think of how to, to solve society's ills <laughs> besides giving everybody, besides giving everybody a uh, universal healthcare. Um, <laughs> that'd be a start. Um, but I, but I think certainly there are, I, the, what we have come to accept as 
masculine, what has been what has been understood and sort of reified as as maleness and what has been sort of propped up um, systemically uh, that and and the sort of power and leverage and um, you know uh, ability to sort of fail upwards that 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 has been afforded you know for the most part white straight cisgender men, Uh uh, that I believe has, uh, has really curdled society. Uh, or at least I can only speak to America, American society. Um, and I think that it has, um, and I think it has led to, uh, all sorts of really, uh, you know, terrible social ills, and so how do we, how do we readjust how, or how do we recalibrate? I, I, I don't want to necessarily say it's to, it's to just be like women because that is a complicated question, even though there is so much about being a woman that I love. And, um, I mean, Actually, I wholesale love, I love being a woman. I love women. I, and I love the women in my life and I admire them. And absolutely. I, you know, if, if, uh, I think that I see so much strength and power in so many different women. Um, and sure, you know, those are, those are qualities that, uh, I think, uh, would, are, are worth, uh, leaning, well, not leaning into, not in the Sheryl Sandberg way, but mm-hmm. leaning into in terms of, you know, thinking about how, uh, to, uh, how to, uh, m- you know, render a society, uh, more inclusive, more, uh, more interested in, um, um, uh, you know, supporting all sorts of people, all sorts of bodies. Uh, but I, I think that we have to, we have to think about this uh, in, in terms of uh, not in, not so much in terms of gendered uh, traits, but what, you know, what sort of principles are uh, are important for the society that we want to live in? And do I think it is probably likely that there are many, many uh, things about the way women uh, tend, uh, are, lots of women tend to be together that, uh, uh, aspects of, uh, female communities that I, that I, that I do think are, um, uh, are wonderful and, and, uh, and worth, uh, and that I do think are, would be, uh, beneficial, uh, widespread. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's prob that is probably true. Um, so you, you talk, especially in the parts where, you, where the memoir uh, sections, you talk a lot about emotion, uh, feeling yourself overcome by emotion. Um, I was, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, like, if I wrote a version of this book, it might be called um, "Not Enough" or "Too Little" or something, because I, I have uh, often been accused of not having, you know, of not being emotional enough or not expressing myself in some way. But then I was also thinking about, you know, there's kind of a. Uh, there's a trend through things like mindfulness meditation and other sort of things. And, you know, uh, uh, Bob Wright, the guy who founded this website, uh, is a, uh, you know, does mindfulness meditation, has talked a lot about this, wrote a book about it. Um, and the way, so I've, I've tried meditating. I never really, it never took for me, but the way he describes it is like, you know, you see the emotion 
uh, like bubbling up in your mind, or you can like observe it, not see it exactly, but you like observe it and and then the kind of like study it from a, like a distance. And mm-hmm. so this is this would be like the and so his argument would be like that's the you know that's the better way to be is to have these emotions at the distance, not be slave to your emotions, um, you know, under, understand the way your mind works. Um, do you, I mean, okay, first of all, have you ever tried any sort of mindfulness meditation or, or anything like that? But also what, what, what do you think of that? Do you see that? Is it, is it, is it better to, I mean, obviously no one wants to be like slave to their emotion and totally taken away by, um, by everything and feel like they're out of control. Um, but do you, do you, yeah. What, 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 what do you, what do you think about that? I think, I think that people, people have got to live in the way that's best for them. I mean, I, you know, I haven't done, I haven't done mindfulness meditation per se. I've, but I've done yoga. I think yoga is wonderful. Um, I do, uh, I do really like, uh, the, what I remember at least one instructor saying when at the beginning, um, at the beginning of the class, you know, of course you're going to have thoughts, but just let them pass by. You don't have to engage with them. And, and that is something that, um, you know, I, that I, that I try to practice if I'm, you know, if I'm feeling really anxious and I want, and I need to fall asleep and, and I'm, and I'm trying to sort of, um, get myself into a space where I, where I, I need to, where I need to calm down for my own comfort, uh, uh-huh. then, then sure. You know, um, I think, I think that there are, there are wonderful, uh, that those are great tools. I, I think that, I think that there are just, there are all sorts of ways to be, you know, I, I am, I am, I think it's pretty safe to say, that I am the most consistently demonstrative and um, outwardly emotional person in my family. Um, And, you know, and my family loves me and I love them. And, you know, and we, we all, I mean, we, we have to, I think that when it comes to, you know, just existing, we, we have to, we, we simply have to do what, what makes sense for us so long as, and I know I'm, I I mean, I'm at the risk of sounding like a, a broken record, um, as long as, we are always taking into consideration what the people in our lives need from us, you know, what, uh, you know, what we owe to what we owe to others. I, ever since, uh, ever since finishing the good place, I've been thinking so much about that show. No, and, no spoilers. I, I, I still so, catch so, up. <laughs> well, some, but something that this is not spoilery, at some point, Chidi asks this question, I think in like a little, in a, in a lecture of what do we owe to each other? Right. That's, so that's, that's the title of an actual book of philosophy that influenced right. the creation of the show. Yeah. And, um, and I, and I love, I love that question. I, and I, I think, I actually think that that is really the question that, we that we should that we should be engaged engaging with you know i i think that we i also do think that we are capable of holding more than than we often than we often do i I, and so when when i when i write about being too much and i you know, sort of draw out the ways that I, that I see it, uh, being stigmatized and becoming a sort of source for, for shame. It's, it is definitely not 
to say. I, I think it's also I think it's also very true that you know the, this whole that whole sort of false binary you know of too much or not enough, which ultimately they're they're kind of one and the same. You know, uh, you know it, it's it's all it that's it's it's all uh it's it, that's a dangerous it's that's all dangerous that's a, that's a different dangerous way to uh to uh to label people i you know i think that so i you know i think that it has been um a very pernicious, pernicious cultural trend uh, to to stigmatize people uh, uh, and to uh, to have sort of inculcated this uh, notion of sort of this sort of gendered uh, notion of feminine excess. Absolutely, but that is not. But that's certainly not to say. Well, that well, frankly, I think that that we should all cry in the movie theater or we should all, you know, we, because no, you know, like, I think, I think it's fine if you do, I think it's fine. You know, I think that if, if somebody is, you know, having a really shitty day and they're sitting on a park bench and they're crying that I think it's too bad that that sort of thing, that that sort of, uh, public display of emotion tends to make people feel really uncomfortable. And I, and I think, you know, that sort of thing, you know, it's not okay because that person is suffering. And, but, you know, that, those sorts of situations, those sorts of situations where somebody is publicly uh, in distress or, or publicly sort of engaging in a, with a sort of bigger emotion. I, I think, I think we should be able to, to not just tolerate that, but, you know, but have empathy for that more than, than we, we tend to, and to, and, you know, not to, you know, I think it's a shame that we're that, and and this is, this is my tendency too. you know, I, if I see somebody who's, you know, sort of going through it, like just on the Metro or something, I, I feel really anxious and I think, well, God, you know, why they're just having a bad day. I should offer them, I should offer them a Kleenex or something and ask if there's anything I can do. And if not, just leave them alone and, you know, that's let them live their life and, you know, and hope that, hope that their day gets better. I, and at the same time, if you are somebody for, who feels that, you know, you know, your, that your life is yours to hold and, you know, and, and to, and that you are, you feel the most comfort in, in only sharing, uh, what you, what you want to share with, you know, with consideration or thought, then that is, that is another perfectly fine way to be. And I, and I think that what my hope is, is just that, you know, we can, we can find ways to, to meet on common ground and, and just, and come to, to sort of under, work a little harder to, uh, to understand that there are, we all that we're all kind of muddling along (laughs) to live in the world, uh, a world that can be very hard to live in, uh, for all sorts of reasons. And, um, and that, you know, I think most of us are, are, are doing the best that we can and, and that, and perhaps we can, uh, you know, offer each other, a little, a little bit more, uh, without, uh, you know, either condemning somebody for being too, to be being too standoffish or too, too closed in or, 
or condemning somebody for being, you know, a hysteric. You know, I, 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 I think, uh, but for me, um, I could only, I could only write from the experience of somebody who, you know, has been seen as a little bit hysterical because I, I, uh, I don't think anybody would ever make the mistake of calling me, um, uh, minimalist. <laughs> okay. Maybe this is my final question. Um, okay. So you, your, your chapter titles are, I think they're all one word and, mm-hmm. um, they're kind of mostly adjectives, um, describing the type of, uh, person, usually a woman who, uh, you're discussing in the, in the chapter. And so some of the, here's, I, I picked out a couple. So here they are, okay. uh, chatterbox, uh, plus, which is kind of like plus size, like uh, weight, uh, body image stuff. Crazy, horny, uh, cheat, uh, which is like in the infidelity chapter, loud and old. And so I picked those out because those are the ones that make me think of our president, uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and, you know, as I got into this, I was thinking like some of these, some of the things you're writing about, like could also describe the personality of the president. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he he is a too much kind of person. Um, yeah. He he is like excess personified in a number of ways, and you know, like he is a chatterbox. Like he loves chit chatting with all the people at Mar-a-Lago, and sometimes he tells them like state secrets and stuff. Um, <laughs> it, whether he's actually crazy or not, we won't really know. Plus, like obviously, he's a little overweight. Um, uh, infidelity, we know we know about that one. Stormy Daniels, uh, you know, loud. He's a loud person. He is old. Um, and I mean, if we just think back to the previous president, Barack Obama, you know, he was not, I would not say he was a too much kind of person. He was Dated. more of this, like, you know, he was compared to like Spock from Star Trek, you know, kind of the unemotional and people were angry that he wasn't being like, he wasn't showing emotion enough and anger at the bankers and, or whoever. Um, and okay. So uh, any thoughts? <laughs> I don't even know what the question is. Any thoughts on this? Like, is the, like, how, where, where does Trump fit into this? And sorry for bringing Trump into everything because, you know, he ruins all of our lives every day. So, but I, I, I just felt compelled to. We're all thinking about, I mean, it's, it's impossible not to think about him. I mean, you, you know, what, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm really glad that you brought that up because, you know, absolutely. That's, um, uh, it, it yeah, it's true. He's a horny chatterbox who, you know, who's just, like, he, I mean, uh, he eats a lot, you know, he, he obviously feels a lot and he expresses his feelings yes, in a way does. that no, no previous president ever has, at least in the modern, like, communications world, you know, when he's, he's tweeting at two in the morning and because he, he yep. just can't keep it in. Yep. Yep. I, so, oh gosh, I have a lot of thoughts on this and they probably <laughs> can't, it would take a while to go through them all and I probably need more alcohol (laughs) but um so well first i would go back to the dave matthews song um i i would not compare dave matthews i don't really know a whole lot about dave matthews uh, except that he seems chill smokes a lot of smokes a lot of weed things seem to be going well for him um when and this is again, you know, I, I always want I always like want to be careful when I make these distinctions because again, I, I don't I I feel very resistant to binaristic thinking, even though of course sometimes you know we have men and women are treated differently and we do have to talk about that. When people when we when when too much the song when Dave, when Dave Matthews too much was, was popular. Uh, when I, I saw it circulating, I often saw it circulating on, you know, like dudes, AIM profiles or away messages because there's something, there's a sort of pride behind it. There is a sort of, uh, almost sort of, feral sort of virality to it. Yeah. I eat a lot. I drink a lot. I'm horny like this. Yeah, this is, this is who I am. And, you know, and and so it's not, and even the song, I mean, if you listen to the song, it's, it's celebratory. It's, it, you know, you could almost, it almost, you could see it, 
uh, being set to like a sort of banquet um, or, you know, like some sort of Roman banquet slash orgy or mm, something. Mm-hmm. You know? what, what was the video? I have no memory of what the video was. I don't either. I don't either. Uh, he's probably playing his guitar. Yeah. They, I, I, is that, well, I'm trying to remember. I guess I remember the ants marching video, but I don't remember. I don't remember any of his other videos. Um, and so, so the thing is, like, there's a lot. So certain types of excess, cer- certainly certain types of excess that are often are are accepted or even even celebrated in men, and there are, and then there are also some. I mean, capitalism is excess, but those who are most powerful benefit from it. So, you know, hooray capitalism. I mean, and so, um, except that is not how I feel that just, just to be clear, (laughs) bracket that. Right. And and just to know, I had a conversation a couple weeks ago with, um, James Ponwazek, who is a TV critic for the times. And he has this new book about Trump and television called Uh audience of one. And he talked about how, you know, Trump, especially in the nineties turned himself into the human embodiment of money. Um, huh. and if you wanted like, you know, it, he would make these cameos in sitcoms or, you know, like he was on McDonald's commercial, like with grimace and stuff, but he was just like, he is a living human, but he's the, the equivalent of like, you know, rich, rich uncle penny bags from the monopoly board. Like he is, he equals money. Yeah. He's like a, a completely, he's like Scrooge McDuck. If Scrooge weren't, delightful and adorable <laughs> and at base a good-hearted person or good-hearted duck i guess <laughs> um, so so yeah you know i trump supporters as best i can tell love all of those things about him they and i don't know i don't think they'd love them i don't think they'd love it in a woman uh, that's my guess uh they, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't, I, you know, I don't think, I don't want to, I don't want to fall in the trap of commenting on anybody's, anybody's body. Uh, I mean, even though his, his tan lines, the, those, there was that recent photo that just kind of. Yeah. Just, showed, showed the, his, his makeup, whatever bronzer he uses. Very kind of ghoulish. Um, but, you know. That I think that for a certain type of person, he yeah he's seen as this sort of authentic, uh, you know, kind of just raw sort of man who who eats his McDonald's and you know loves. Uh, you know, purportedly love, you know, loves to get laid and all, and all of that. And, and so, you know, I guess, so my feeling about this is first, you know, yeah, the, these things that, uh, that become, that can often be the downfall of a woman, especially a woman in, in the public sphere, you know, yeah, those, those of us who are horrified by Donald Trump, yeah, absolutely. We look at him and we're like, you know, you are just an absolute debauched human being. But that said, the you know, the the worst things to me about Trump are not that he eats McDonald's or that he's a philanderer. It's that he's, you know, he's put kids in cages at the border and, you know, that he's, that he's stridently racist and that he's, he's a misogynist, that he's a sex criminal. And, you know, I, you know, and it's hard to say where certain tendencies end or where they start to, to curdle and, and become monstrous, you know, I absolutely, you know, there, there is, there is being the sort of person who has been historically sort of lampooned or stigmatized as being too much, being excessive because they're 
emotional or uh, they're very, uh, they're much more open about their sexuality. Um, and then there is, there is living without any kind of regard for, for other people and living in a way in which you're only serving yourself. You're only interested in yourself. You're only, you're, you're, you're just indulgently at the whim of your own inclinations. And that is only the start of how I feel about, about Trump, of course. But, you know, but I think that, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if Trump, you know, not that Trump reads, but if Trump were to try and use, uh, my book as, uh, as a defense, we would have words, (laughs) 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 um, uh, just, you know, like I said, just as if, just as if, you know, someone like Kellyanne Conway or Hope Hicks or, you know, any of these, these women who, who've, who've shored up, uh, the, the, uh, the horror show that we're living through right now, uh, you know, uh, but that I would, I would certainly, I, I would, uh, tell them to hold on a fucking minute, uh, too. Um, yeah. I mean, just, just to, you know, to, it's so it's hard to imagine, you know, the things that Trump does, not in terms of the policies he implements, but the way he like performs the right. role and the, just the everyday things he does. It's it's hard to imagine a successful woman politician, you know, getting away with those things that yeah. that woman would be called hysterical, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, no way. Yeah. And but the, I mean, what of the I mean, Trump is such a strange human, such a strange public figure, <laughs> like. You know, he he does embody like some stereotypical or traditional female like traits. Like, mm-hmm. like yeah, he does wear like he wears makeup every every single day. Like he's a, he's a, he's a public man who wears makeup every day, and he does something to his hair every day that takes a very long time. And that kind of stuff, like if that had been like a Democrat in the '90s doing those things, then like they would have been run out of town on a rail or something. Yeah, um, but it's yeah. just because yeah. he's, he has this weird bulletproof quality because he doesn't give a shit about anything. And the Republican yeah. base is, you know, has turned into a cult of personality. He can get away with doing these, doing these strange things, but obviously he's very like image obsessed, very vain, yeah. but also yeah. has this bizarre, you know, the makeup, the hair. Um, so, so yeah, it's like, I don't know. There's, there's some sort of gender studies paper that could be, could be written on all this. And maybe it has already. Absolutely. Oh yeah. I mean, and, And absolutely. I mean, I I think and I think some of it, you know, it's absolutely it 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 can't it's not it's not at all simple. But I think some of it can just can be explained by by saying, you know, the powerful are willing to forgive a lot uh, in somebody who who's interested in ensuring that they stay powerful, Mm -hmm. they stay rich and um and that they keep their grip on what was what it 99% of the wealth in the country, you know? I, uh, so yeah, I think that if, if Bernie Sanders were, were up there, uh, wearing, you know, it'd be perfect. It'd be perfectly fine. It'd be perfectly fine if he wanted, if he wanted to wear foundation or something or something like that. But if he were doing it, forget it. Yeah. Uh, Republicans would be, uh, would be going nuts and, uh, even more, even, or they would be, uh, raising hell even more than they already are at, at, at the idea of, uh, of a democratic socialist nominee. Um, you know, and, and yeah, and, and if it were, uh, if it were a woman who, who were, who was, uh, who did not self-regulate in, in the way that every female uh, politician and, uh, has to, uh, then yeah, uh, that would be everybody, uh, including, uh, members of her own party would, would be, uh, would be freaking out about that too. Yeah. Uh, and if you think about it, like, if you compare, um, Trump's public performance to like Nancy Pelosi's public performance, I mean, she did this thing where she tore up the copy of the speech, which was like a theatrical thing, but, but usually she's very, like you know, she's very buttoned up. Uh, yeah. She she speaks in this very measured tone of voice. Like she doesn't. I can't recall her ever yelling. Um, and yeah, everything is very carefully considered. And that's you know they're about the same age. Uh, you know that's that that's like the. But but she's a woman. Right, and I think and even you know I, I have sort of mixed feelings about 
the tearing thing. I, I guess, you know, I, it was because it, it, because it was, it was, it was, it was performative and yes, I mean, everything is performative, but I mean, didn't, didn't she ex- extend her hand, hand to try to shake his hand? At the, yeah. He, he, he uh, buffed gave, her. gave her the whiff or whatever and refused yeah. to shake her hand. And it's sort of like, well, you know, if you're still sort of making these overtures of like civility, then, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, it, well, I mean, the whole the outrage is obviously, obviously phony. phony. Um, yeah. um, and, yeah. and the idea that we're concerned about civility in the age of, of Trump when he's, you know, gives uh, insulting monikers to people and, you know, right. talks about shithole countries and, and so on and so forth. Like this is this is all just like kabuki, you know, bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah. And again, even even the way that she ripped the the speech it was very again very measured and and you know and there's there was something kind of there was something sort of pleasurable sure about watching her do it and just do it very demurely but but it did it felt like if it, it felt it felt to me a little like hollow like like she was performing the angry woman but she was performing it in the only way that she knew she could do it i mean of course she was still going to be i'm, I'm I'm sure Fox News is still calling her a shrieking harpy for for having done it, but but really it was it was a pretty uh, you know uh, you know it was it was a pretty tame display. Yeah. As oh, I mean I I would just assume I mean I don't I don't really know that it it changed much of anything. Um, I, I think I mean the main thing it did is that uh, you know. Uh, However, you know, um, a, a week later, like no one who who remembers. I mean, I guess Trump did all these sort of reality TV style things during it. Like there was a, a um, you know, the uh, awarding the Medal of Freedom to Brush Limbaugh, and then the reunion between the so- the soldier and the and the wife, and so all all this all these kind of stunt type things. And this was just one more stunt, but it seemed to be an improvised stunt instead of like a carefully planned one. And people are, you know, mostly say the union dresses are forgettable, but I don't, you know, nothing he said, there's no sentence or something or new proposal that people are remembering. Like we're still thinking about tearing up the the thing. So if that neutralized, whatever he was actually, he's trying to do, then, you know, great. Yeah. What the hell? Then that's, yeah. Then then that I'm glad if that's, if that's the effect it had. (laughs) Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? We've gone a little long, but you know, no one's stopping us uh, or we could wrap it up here. Um, no, I mean, thank you. This is, I, I really, I appreciate, um, I appreciate having such a one, wonderfully rigorous conversation and for, you know, making me think about, uh, pushing me to think about all of these, um, all of these different, uh, aspects of the book that, you know, I, and I've sort of, you know, maybe occurred to me, but that I haven't, I haven't had to really, uh, uh, think through, uh, in, uh, in in this way and and articulate before so so i thank you okay well, well you're welcome that's great and thank you for coming on back on culture determined so here's the book here's the book again too much a victorian constraints still behind women today uh and by the time this this airs it will be on sale um so you know check it out wherever uh so uh thank you rachel uh for coming on um and uh thank you to our viewers and listeners and we'll see you again next time thanks